What's up, family? Welcome back to the Tariqa Lee Radio Show. And this is your gracious host, Mr. Tariqa Lee Nashi. Glad to have y'all tuning in. And don't forget to go to TariqElite.com, by the way, to get all that fresh gear, get the fresh new t-shirts, get the RBG t-shirts. Get those Melanoid Nation t-shirts. Get the Melanoid Nation flag and fly it high. Again, that's at TarikaLeet.com. Um, let me shout out to all the family. Thanks, everybody, for giving me all the well wishes. I didn't get a chance to do my, my live Ustream show this Sunday because my son, I had to take him to the emergency room. My son, TJ, he's two and a half, for those who don't know. And I had to take him to the emergency room because there was something going on. I think he had some kind of... I want to say stomach poisoning, a food poisoning or something. He ate or consumed something that messed his stomach up and he was throwing up like crazy. We thought it was some kind of stomach virus. And we went to the emergency room on Sunday night. I was there all night. They tried to give him something to stop the vomiting. They did like a ultrasound and they didn't find nothing. Then they felt around and didn't see nothing and did a urine test and didn't find anything. So... They sent us home, but then the next day, the next morning, his heart was beating off fast. He was still dragging around. So I took him back to the emergency room. And they really, we were there for a few hours. They didn't really do anything. You know, told us basically the same thing. He was throwing up in the hospital, and, you know, we left. And yesterday, I took him to another emergency room because I wasn't satisfied with the one I went to before. And they had to hook my son up to the uh, an IV because he was extremely dehydrated. And they did a uh, blood test on him. And they, it didn't have a virus. That's the thing. Because a lot of people, I was asking questions on Twitter and Facebook. Because sometimes people in the, the, the melanoid family, they kind of know stuff too. And a lot of us were thinking that it was some kind of virus. But he didn't have an infection, didn't have a virus. And we, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. He's still a little under the weather. Right now, he's still kind of moping around. He's not throwing up anymore, so he's getting better. But it's very weird. We don't know what's going on. I'm, it's my conjecture. He might have consumed something that kind of messed his stomach up. It wasn't a virus, but it made him throw up. And because he threw up and he's not really, he, he doesn't have an appetite, so he got dehydrated. And, you know, that probably caused constipation, which makes him more drowsy. So we're, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out, but he's doing good. So thank you to the family for giving your well wishes for my baby boy and all that good stuff. So let me, um, a lot of folks are calling. Let me see who's on the phone right now. A lot of are calling. Hey, what's up? Who's calling? Hey, what's up, Tariq? It's Damien from Raleigh, North Carolina, man. Hey, Damien, how you doing, fam? I'm chilling, man. I'm on the way home. I don't know if you elaborated yet on the uh, Minister Farrakhan thing in South Carolina. Yeah, I'm talk Just about, wondering what, what yeah, went on. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, man. Thank you for the call. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So let me, let me just chop up some game because I do want to get into that situation with the minister. But before I get into that, there's a, let me talk about some other stories that's going on. There was a story online today about a 14-year-old Muslim boy one a dark skinned Muslim boy. He's not one of those pale Arab. He's a darker skinned Muslim boy. If it wasn't for his hair, you can just look at him and say, okay, that's just a brown skinned black guy, a brown skinned black kid. But he has the little the Middle Eastern S curl, so that's a giveaway. But if he had a hat on, he he just be another melanoid brother walking around. So this fourteen year old kid, you know, he's a little inventor. He took something. To, to school to show his engineer teacher he put together a little project where he made his own clock he made a clock and took it to school to show his engineer teacher and the, the school called the police on his ass and said that nigga had a bomb and they went to the school and arrested the kid there's pictures of him in handcuffs he's 14 years old they detained him, questioned him, put him in juvie the whole nine the whole shebang so he's like confused his parents are confused no they got their nigga wake up call see a lot of these people out here see that's the thing about white supremacy y'all think a lot of people come over here and think that they're gonna jump on the side of white supremacy no white supremacy is circling its wagons now 
So all melanoid people are suspects. See, back in the day, well, not even back in the day, people thought that they could get away with saying, well, I'm not black, I'm I'm mixed, I'm Dominican, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm an Arab, I'm a Muslim, I'm East Indian. See, the, the when shit goes down, the white supremacists, they don't ask for your, your non-Negro papers. If you're a non-white, they just throw you off in the same bucket. Just like they did with the Creoles down there in... Um, in Louisiana when France sold Louisiana to the United States all those mixed people in the Creoles and the mulattoes and the blue vein society type people they got a wake up call because see the French you know they were white supremacists too but the French would they would at least humor you to a certain degree they had a little caste system going on where they would treat the mulatto class just a little better just like in Haiti just like in Haiti too, all those French speaking places, they would treat the mulatto class just a little bit better. And what happened was the French sold Louisiana or the Louisiana territory to the United States. And when the United States came down there, they start taking a census like, okay, who's white? Raise your hand. All right. Who's not white? Well, we're Creole. What does that mean? Well, we're a mixture of French and Indian and black. Well, are you white, though? Well, not really. Well, okay, we'll get over there in the nigger section. They got their nigger wake-up call. They get over there in the nigger section. That's why I use the term melanoid. It's an all-encompassing term so that people globally who are melanated people of African descent who are disenfranchised by systematic white supremacy, you can have a common name. You can all have a common name and a common title to identify yourselves as so that you can build and, and empower yourself based on that common title so we can erase all those borders. Because see, the white supremacists, they've erased all their borders. They don't say, well, I'm, I'm Italian, I'm Jewish, I'm French, I'm Spanish. They all, we're white. Anywhere you go, we're white. And they dominate and empower themselves based on that title. So we got to start thinking strategically and we got to start getting our cold game on. But what's interesting about this little Muslim boy who they came out and, and called the little kid a terrorist and they arrested him. Barack Obama spoke out. Barack Obama immediately issued a tweet saying, hey keep your head up I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what the tweet says I'm not looking at the tweet right now but the tweet was very encouraging to the 14 year old boy hey like hey yeah, you did a good job keep up the good work something like that it was some very encouraging words that Obama gave for this 14 year old Arab boy now this incident just happened I think it happened yesterday and Obama immediately came out and defended this kid and said, hey, he, this kid is all right. Now, Barack Obama does not do that for black American people. You notice that? We get slaughtered in the damn street over and over again, and Barack Obama twiddles his thumbs and don't say nothing. And you got to understand how money talks, see? Because, see, in the Arab community, they make their money talk. People whose money talk they get they get represented people will speak up for them when your money talks people will speak up for you just like in the the gay community when something happens to a gay person barack obama's right there speaking out if something happens to somebody hispanic barack obama's right there speaking out what was that that gay was it a basketball player who came out barack obama right on the money hey hey good for you for being so brave good for you for being so brave You dig? So when you are part of a, another group or you're representing another group like the gay community, which is what that, that black ball player was doing, you get props for that because the white gay community, they put money in the game. And they know that that black basketball player was just a pawn. But Barack Obama with us, he calls us thugs. If you're out there causing trouble, you don't, don't be acting like thugs. We get the thug treatment. 
And that's because we don't put no money in the game. We got to understand the money game. We got to start putting money in the game and getting these people in our back pockets financially. We got to get our money game together. We got to get our ownership game together so that we can call shots when things go down, family. You got to get your money right. And speaking of calling shots and things going down, now a caller just hit up the show talking about a situation that happened in South Carolina, in Charleston, South Carolina, with Minister Farrakhan. Now, as we know, Minister Farrakhan is going around the country promoting the Million Man March anniversary in Washington, D.C. That's going to be held on October 10th. Yours truly will be there. Me and my squad, we will be out there in D.C., Making it do what it do. I will be out there. A lot of people ask me if I'm going to be out there. Yes, I am going to be out there. I will absolutely be out there in D.C. And the minister, he, he's going around promoting it. And he was going to go to Charleston, South Carolina, to promote the, the Justice or Else rally. And when he tried to get the church that was shot up by Dylan Roof, the, the A&E church, he was trying to go to that church to commemorate the families and the people, which would have been a great place for him to actually have his speech in Charleston, right there in the epicenter of what went down with the white supremacist Dylan Roof, the terrorist. So the minister wanted to do a, a speech at the church, but the church people backed out. All of these black churches out there in Charleston started backing out and they didn't want the minister to come in and give a speech and there was one church I don't, I'm not sure which one it is but one of the, one of the churches wanted the minister to sign some kind of paper or some kind of release form saying that he wouldn't say anything controversial there's a black church doing this this is a black church doing this and also the minister wanted to speak at one of the schools there and we talked about this on melanoynation.org by the way so the minister wanted to have the speech at a school, one of the universities there, one of the colleges there. They backed out because see, one, one of the colleges, they were going to try to make the price of the rental of the venue real high, which a lot, they will do that a lot of times. A lot of times when they don't want nobody, a certain person to do a lecture at a venue. And I, I've dealt with this before because my company, when I do lectures, my production company, we rent, we rent the venues out ourselves. So a lot of times when people try to discourage you from getting their venue, they'll just give you an astronomical price that's just utterly ridiculous and not even cost effective. They'll say, yeah, 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 you can rent the venue out. It's $10,000 to rent the venue. You know, it's something real ridiculous. So they can't say that they're being discriminatory. They just threw a high ass price out there so that you won't be able to get it. But I think the minister and those guys were still going to get it, but they came up with another reason to not have him in the venue. But, but and I'm not shocked over the white supremacists who own these venues. I'm not shocked because of them. But it's just the Negroes there that I'm disgusted with. How scary they are. Because y'all have to remember in Charleston, South Carolina. In Charleston, South Carolina. When Dylan Roof, the white supremacist terrorist. Stood up. And shot those nine people in that church out there. Those black church Negroes line up in a single file formation to uh, forgive and pray for Dylan Roof. They made every excuse in the book to forgive and to pray and all that stuff. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was it, it completely sad. And these same people who sat up here and forgave Dylan Roof, now they got a problem with Minister Farrakhan. So that scared slave mentality, man, that shit has to die. That I'm going to forgive Massa for harming us, but I'm going to shun this black man for speaking the truth because he's going to get us in more trouble with Massa. They killing you out there. They walking up in churches killing you. So how much more trouble can you be in? We scared what's going to happen. What, what else is going to happen? It can't get no worse. Out there in South Carolina, they shooting black, black folks in the back. They're shooting black folks in the back. They're shooting grandmamas in churches. So how bad, how else worse can it get? It's 
So they open up and, and, and welcome the white supremacists with open arms. They welcome the white supremacists with open arms. They let them run amok and get up there and cry and forgive and pray with them. And the minute a black person say, hey, let me come to your church so I can speak truth to power and empower the black community. These niggas are like this. Come on. Hell no. To the no, no, no. They were in Hell church just like the this. No. Hell to the no. To the no, no, no. That's how they were about Farrakhan. That's exactly how they were. But anyway, I digress, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let me let me play this. I, I Somebody just sent me a link of this today. Now, they're talking about Richard Sherman. They said that Richard Sherman is jumping on the coon train. Uh, he's making some comments about black on black crime. Now, I haven't seen this. I, I, a few people have sent me this. Somebody hit me on Twitter. By the way, y'all can follow me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed if you're not following me. Follow me on Twitter right now at Tariq Nasheed. Follow me on Instagram at Tariq Elite if you're not following me. All right, but let me play this clip. This is Richard Sherman. Somebody sent this to me, and he gave a press conference either today or he, it was today. And they must have gotten to Richard Sherman. Here is, here is I have, this is my first time hearing it, so let me see what it says. Before we get started, I'm going to address the, because there was some article written, um, you know, if you guys have seen it, um, talking about uh, King Noble and, and all this. I, I did not write that article. Um, a lot of people had sent it to me over the weekend, but I just thought this would be the best place to address it. Um, but I, there were some points in that article or in that post um, that, that, that were relevant and, and I could agree with. Um, but there are also some obviously ignorant points in there. Um, I don't think it's any, any times a time to call out for an all-out war against police or you know any race of people. Um, I thought that was an ignorant statement. But... Um, as a black man, I do understand that black lives matter. You know, I, I stand for that. I believe in that wholeheartedly. Um, but I also think that there's a way to go about things and and there's a way to do things. And I think the issue at hand needs to be addressed internally and before we move on. Because from personal experience, you know, you have living in the hood, living in a inner city, you deal with things, you know, you deal with people dying, um, dealt with a best friend getting killed. Um, and it, it, it was two 35-year-old black men, you know, and wasn't no police officer involved, wasn't any, anybody else involved, and I didn't hear anybody shouting Black Lives Matter then. Um, and okay. I think that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's, that, that's such a weak argument. That's that, And I like Richard Sherman, and I know that he has to be politically correct. Well, y'all stop making that weak-ass argument. And I'll get on it in a minute. Let me finish this. The point we need to, to get to is that we need to deal with our own internal issue before we move forward. Our own internal issues are stemmed by white supremacy. Black folks, will y'all please shut the fuck up talking about we got to deal with our own internal issues. Our internal issues are getting dealt with. That's why the prisons are filled up. Our own internal issues are dealt with. We getting locked up left and right for any crime that dusty niggas commit. I'm not responsible for dusty niggas, by the way. And let me play the rest of this. And, and start pointing fingers and start attacking other people. We need to solidify ourselves as people and, and deal with our issues because I think as long as we have black on black crime and, and, and black, you know, one black man killing another, you know, if you if black lives matter, then they should matter all the time. Um, oh, you never, if OK, if you have if black on black crime, what they never explain what the hell they're talking about. If we're going to have black on black crime, we shouldn't do what what we should just allow the cops to kill our kids. Because a nigga in Chicago or a nigga somewhere in Compton or a nigga in Cleveland hit another nigga in the head with a bottle. So now we should let the cops blow our brains out and shoot us in the back and shoot our children and beat our mothers. What what kind of clusterfuck logic do y'all have? That's white supremacist logic. Never let somebody, somebody get killed. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's brother. That's somebody's friend. Um, so you should always keep that in mind. And, and okay, let, okay, uh, that, that's enough. Now, with, with, with Richard, I, I wouldn't quite put him on the coon train yet. Because he, he's just being, he, he's just being a, a puppet for the NFL. You know, he, they don't let you say anything radical. You can't really go all out Marshawn Lynch, you, you know, because Marshawn Lynch didn't say anything too radical, but they still punished him. So they know where their bread is buttered. Let's just be clear. They put them out because they know... While these niggas out here on the podium, 
the coaches and the owners in the back waving their paychecks around looking at them like hey you see this check don't don't you want your check don't you don't say the wrong thing now so they're waving the paycheck in front of them in the back of the room so you, you I, I don't really put them on the coon train too much because these are 40 million dollar slaves a lot of athletes, man, are nothing but $40 million slaves. Go read the book, $40 million slaves. That's all they are. They got to do what they're told. They got to say what Massa wants them to say. They can't be radical like athletes used to be in the 1960s and 70s. So I, I just take what he says with a grain of salt. Because they know all those dollars will dry up real fast all those endorsements will dry up real fast if they start acting out of order because they're totally controlled financially by the white supremacists but this whole thing about what about black on black crime ain't no such thing as black on black crime there's just crime when black people say some dumb shit like man I'm more concerned I'm more likely to get harmed by another black person than a white person you know why dumb nigga because you live around a bunch of black folks so of course whoever's going to commit a crime next to you is going to look like you a white dude ain't going to go to a black neighborhood to commit a crime they commit crimes in their own neighborhood just like black folks commit crimes in their own neighborhood that's such a tired argument you're never going to stop black on black crime because no group of people are perfect Every group has crime. We are taught or we're told as black folks that we're supposed to be a perfect group of people. We got knuckleheads in the white community, the Asian community, the Latino community, the, the black community. But the thing is, we get defined by our knuckleheads. And we got to stop allowing that to happen. We got to stop allowing people. And I point to the white supremacists. See, I don't the, the knuckleheads within black society, they they're knuckleheads you can't really get to them but I'm like why are you trying to define me based on this fool's actions I saw a video that was circulating on Facebook it was a bunch of niggas out here in Memphis they were at the some state fair it was a group of black folks who got in a fight with the carnival ride um, guy the guy who operates the carnival ride I guess the line was moving too slow. Then these country ass niggas got, got mad. Then they start beating the guy and fighting. It was real niggerish. And I was looking at the comment section because again, the white supremacists, they love shit like that. So these videos usually go viral. But then you see a bunch of Negroes in there. Pole mouth, cop and please ass niggas. Oh man, that makes us black folks look bad. Oh, I'm so embarrassed for to be a black person. They reflect badly on black folks. Nigga, speak for yourself. Dusty niggas do not reflect badly on me at all. Dusty niggas do not reflect badly on me. Dusty niggas do not represent me. And if you are a person trying to define me based on the actions of a dusty nigga, most likely you are a white supremacist. And if I'm to be judged by dusty niggas, then I'm going to judge you, white person, on the white supremacist and you owe me some reparations. That's your answer to all of these people. If you're going to be defined and judged by the actions of dusty ass Negroes, the white supremacists should give you reparations because they should be held accountable for all the systematic white supremacy in the last 500 years all over this country. Then all of you are complicit to it. That's it, that you tell them that every time they bring that up. If I'm responsible for these niggas in Chicago who done shot somebody, then you're responsible for 400 years of white supremacy. Give me a check. If I'm responsible for some crackhead doing the Dougie outside a, um, a, a, a liquor store in Buckhead, then you are responsible for all these white supremacist cops and white supremacist juries disenfranchising black people. Write me a check, please. Dusty niggas don't define me. And y'all got to stop letting them define you. But I digress. Let me get a call before I get a little deeper on the show. What's up? Who's calling? Uh, hi, this is Nancy. I'm calling from Chicago, Illinois. Hey, Nancy. How are you, love? I'm fine. How are you? I can't believe I got through. Yes, indeed. But, What's um, on your mind, Nancy? 
Okay, um, actually, I, I have two questions for you. Um, my first question is, I have a friend who is, I want to say that she says that she's kind of pro-black or whatever like that, but I think she's a, a Negro bag wrench. Okay. And I want to know, how can I go about still being friends with her? Because I really can't express my conscious views with her without her becoming offended, and I just want to know how can I deal with her. Okay, so, but she does kind of act pro-black? Yeah, she does. Somewhat. But Somewhat. then, when I, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but she dates white dudes, basically, right? Uh, yeah, she dates, um, she has the thing for Hispanic guys. Oh, okay. That's She's open thing. to all races. Okay, but yeah, but the same thing. That, that's white, too. A lot of them, they try to uh, date Hispanic dudes as a substitute for the white guy. But it, most Hispanics are classified as white, so that's still Negro bedwinching. And again, some um, there were Spanish Hispanic slave owners too. Um, Spain, when they came over here, they had people enslaved too. So I, I don't give them a pass. But with people like that, what you're going to have to do, don't let her know too much of your business because what she's going to do is run and tell all these other people and all these other groups your business. The Negro bedwinches are some of the biggest snitches and tattletales out there in the game. And that's their job is to get intel on black society and go tell it to other people. So you got to keep okay. your information real, real sacred from her. All right. Y'all can be cool or whatever, but don't tell her your business because the Negro okay. bedwinches, that's their job to go snitch on you. All right, but thank you for the call. Okay. Dear. All right. Let me let me get into this because that, that's kind of going into what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about today's show is about the white supremacist no snitch code. Because, see, people always talk about how black folks are the problem because we have a no snitching rule. The white supremacists love talking about that. All oh, these black people, the problems in the black community, y'all have so much crime because black folks don't like to snitch. You guys have this no snitching rule. That is a total, complete lie. That is a total, complete lie. There is no no snitching rule in black society. That's just all talk. I know a few years ago they even had no snitching t-shirts. The, the, that no snitching myth, that's all it is is a myth. Black people are the biggest snitches and tattletales on the planet. We live to tell each other's business. We are the tellingest, gossipingest people. We love putting each other on blast. We are the tattletellingest people ever made. Black American people. We got whole websites and message boards like Lipstick Alley and Shade Room and Ball Alert and Media Takeout. All tattletale sites. We got television shows like Love and Hip Hop, which are tattletale sites, meaning if you have sex with a celebrity and go tell about it, you can get a TV show. We reward each other for tattletelling on each other, telling each other's business. We reward each other for that in black society. So that no snitching is a complete myth. Look at the show First 48. How long does it take them niggas to start telling on my whole hood the minute they get in an interrogation room? When them niggas get in an, an interrogation room, all they take, it takes them about 15 minutes to get them to snitch on everybody. So we are the snitchingest, tattletellingest people on the planet. And that comes from the plantation because we were rewarded with butter biscuits. And I go back listening to my listen to my show talking about the butter biscuit brigade. We used to get rewarded literally with butter biscuits for telling on each other. So that whole no snitching bullshit, let's get off that in black society. Now, the people who don't snitch on each other for real are the white supremacists. Now, the white supremacists, they got a strict no snitching code when it comes to each other. They do not snitch on each other. This is why these juries won't convict white supremacists. They won't even charge them. Hell, if they charge them, that's why these white supremacists, when they harm somebody, and I'm talking about somebody who has established themselves as a white supremacist by harming a, a black person or a melanoid person, the other white supremacists, they don't tell on them. They go out of their way to protect them. I saw a fight out here in my neighborhood 
and wh- where I stay, I stay in a suburban area. A lot of white people out here where I live. And a few weeks ago, about eh, about three o'clock in the morning, there was a white couple, and it, I live in a real quiet area. And about three in the morning, my neighbors, two of them, were obviously high or drunk, and they were out in the street fighting, cursing extremely loud, and their car alarm going off because the dude is kicking the car. He's throwing bricks at the house. She's cursing. I mean, they were cursing for hours. And I noticed something. I'm like, well, the police is going to be here any minute. Because they were out there acting a fool. And the police never came. And I know I wasn't the only one who heard them. Other people heard them. They were extremely loud, but the other white people in the neighborhood, they did not call the police on them. And I noticed, okay, they got a no snitching rule out here too. Now, black people, when we show up, we don't even have to do anything for the white supremacists to call the cops on us. But people in the dominant white supremacist society, they do not tell on each other. And the thing is, this is the thing. When a person in white society does snitch on a white supremacist, the other white supremacists will punish that person. They will punish you for snitching. They have a mechanism that they will punish you if you were to snitch on people who are white supremacists. So they have punishments for their no snitching rule. In Oregon, and we did a story on this on MelanoiNation.org. And by the way, everybody go to MelanoiNation.org. Make your small donations, by the way, because what we're doing at MelanoiNation.org, we have something going on now where we're going to donate money every week to an African-centered school around the country. This is something we're doing every week. We're going to do this for the rest of the year. We donate money every week. We're finding different African-centered schools and we donate money to them so they can keep up the good work, work educating our youths. And you can get involved with that. Just make a small donation to MelanoiNation.org and go to my Instagram. We'll let you know who we're donating to every week because we post the check. We post the information of the school. So this is something that we're actively doing right now. We just donated to a school in Chicago um, last week. A few weeks before that, we donated to a school in Oakland. So this is what we're doing, and you can get involved with that, but I digress. But again, on MelanoiNation.org, we did a story about this police officer in Oregon. White guy, white cop, very brave white male, who had a supervisor. His police chief was an extreme white supremacist. His police chief was at the department making fun of black people, making monkey noises, and just really acting very racist and making very racist derogatory comments towards black people. So now this cop, this cop told on his supervisor, the cop did the right thing. The cop did what he was supposed to do as an honest cop. He said, look, I'm, I'm a cop. I didn't, I didn't sign up to, for this. I, I, I don't really, I didn't sign up to work for or be supervised by an open racist. That's just not what I'm going to do. So I'm going to do the right thing and and turn my supervisor in. And he did. And I think the supervisor got terminated and the city was very reluctant to terminate him. The city, knowing that this guy was a bleeding racist, that city in Oregon spoke very highly of the cop. And again, you can read the whole story on MelanorNation.org. But what's interesting, though, this cop who told... He's been getting death threats from other white supremacists. They've been, they tried to run his wife off the road. People driving by his house calling him nigger. See how slick the white supremacists are? See, they're punishing this guy for turning in and snitching on an open white supremacist. They don't like you snitching on the white supremacists. They will punish you. And again, when they punish you, like I said, not only is the code to not snitch designated to the white supremacists the code requires white supremacy the white supremacist society to protect those who get snitched on so now when you have white supremacists who get snitched on they're protected just like that cop down there in um texas that did that barrel roll case bolt that's his name he was out there jumping on those little black teenagers 
doing the little barrel rolls, jumping on him. And a white kid was filming him. And a white kid snitched on him, basically. And he ended up getting fired. But, you know, now I think he's consulting and other... He's, he's raised money from other white supremacists. So the white supremacists, they're protecting this guy. And I think he's had other job offers for other police departments on the low. So they've been supporting that guy low-key. The white supremacists, they will protect those who get snitched on. That's part of the code. We have to understand how to deal with the... Or, or understand the codes of white supremacy. See, this is why when we teach black history, we also need to teach white supremacy courses. We really need to teach courses on white supremacy so that you can understand how that works. But you got to understand this. When white people break the code and tell on other white people and other white supremacists, the white person is usually ostracized and the white supremacist is always protected. Look at Dog the Bounty Hunter. Now, Dog the Bounty Hunter, one of his relatives turned on him and broke the code and recorded him going on a racist rant about black people. One of his white relatives broke the code and, and snitched on him and put it out there to the media. And he temporarily got in trouble. But what happened was the white supremacist culture, they surrounded and protected him from being snitched on. And they ended up giving him his job back. They gave him his show back. He didn't miss a beat. Justin Bieber, same thing. Somebody snitched on Justin Bieber. They found some old tapes of Justin Bieber using the N-word. And they put that out, sent it to TMZ. But white supremacist culture, they're surrounding and protecting Justin Bieber. They did a little roast. They did a, a comedy roast of him to kind of beat up on him a little bit as his punishment, so to speak. It was all strategic. They did a, a Comedy Central roast, beat him up a little bit verbally. You know, he, he repented. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I made some mistakes. Now they put him back out there in the limelight. They protect him. That's what they do. They protect the white supremacists. Look at Paula Dean. Paula Dean was snitched on by another white person. That whole case with Paula Dean calling black folks nigger and trying to get black folks to dress up like slaves. That was a white woman who turned Paula Dean in and snitched on her. It was a white woman exposed that. Now what are they doing? They're protecting Paula Dean. Her ass is on Dances with the Stars. She's on Dancing with the Stars white right now, the biggest show on television. The white supremacists brought her back in to make her have a comeback. They're building her back up. They're protecting her as part of their code. Look at Hulk Hogan. A white person snitched on Hulk Hogan by recording him making a bunch of racist comments and put it out there. They broke the code, put him on out there. He was saying all types of derogatory stuff about black folks. Now Hulk Hogan is getting endorsements now. There's some, I think a big furniture corporation has given Hulk Hogan an endorsement. Look at that. Whenever you get into a scandal, usually people back away from you. When you say something about black folks, you get endorsements. When you show people that you are a straight up white supremacist who's down to speak badly about black people other white supremacists will come around you and rally behind you and protect you because they have a code of conduct family the white supremacists have a very no snitching code and they protect those who are snitched on and they do this because they have an economy and they know how to get their money game together and that's what we have to start doing family we got to stop being on that dumb shit and start learning how to circulate and using our money to empower ourselves. That's what I do with Melanoy Nation. We aggregate the money in order to empower the kids at least. But we have to start doing that on a regular basis on grander scales. We have to get our economy game on. We got to get our business game on so we can start using our money as weapons like they use their money as weapons against us. You understand that? Anyway, y'all, that's been today's episode. Let me get a couple of more calls before I get out of here. Because I got to check on my son. I got to make sure he's cool. What's up? Who's calling? Hey, what's up, Tariq? What, what is going on, man? This is my first time calling. I'm Mark. I'm from Cleveland. What's up? Hey, man, what's going on with you, fam? What's, hey, what's on going mind? on, fam? Nothing much, man. I got a homework assignment for the family. Check this out. 
Okay, this documentary is on Netflix. It's called The Boogeyman, The Lee Atwater Story. And if y'all look at this, man, it breaks down the code of white supremacy. Y'all check that documentary out if it's still up on Netflix. But, brother, I appreciate what you're doing. You're breathing new life into me and, 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 and into the family, man. God bless you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Much respect. Peace thank, out, fam. Thank you so much, fam. The, I'm going to check that out. The Boogeyman. I think somebody else mentioned that to me. And speaking of Ohio, I'm going to be in Toledo, Ohio on November 14th doing a lecture. I think at the, I, I want to say the Civil Rights Museum, something like that. The promoter, he's going to send me the flyer. We got the venue. He has the venue. I want to say it's the Civil Rights Theater or Museum. It's one of these venues. I, I When he gives me the flyer, I will give you guys the information. But it will be in Toledo, Ohio, November 14th. I want to see everybody in that area in the place. I'll give you more details coming up soon. But it, again, family, go to MelanoidNation.org. Make your donation. Go to TariqElite.com. Get some of that fresh gear. Go to Tariq Radio. Check out some of the lectures. TariqRadio.com. Check out the Code of Conduct lecture and the International Racism lecture. All right, fam, I will holler at you guys this Sunday on Ustream. I am out of here, family. Y'all be safe. Y'all be good. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed. I'm a holla. Questions on Twitter and Facebook. Because sometimes people in the, the, the Melanoid family, they kind of know stuff too. And a lot of us were thinking that it was some kind of virus, but he didn't have an infection, didn't have a virus, and we, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. He's still a little under the weather. Right now, he's still kind of moping around. He's not throwing up anymore, so he's getting better. But it's very weird. We don't know what's going on. I'm, it's my conjecture. He might have consumed something that kind of messed his stomach up. It wasn't a virus, but it made him throw up. And because he threw up and he's not really, he, he doesn't have an appetite, so he got dehydrated. And, you know, that probably caused constipation, which makes him more drowsy. So we're, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out. But he's doing good. So thank you to the family for giving your well wishes for my baby boy. And all that good stuff. So let me, um, a lot of folks are calling. Let me see who's on the phone right now. Oh, no, no. So this 14-year-old kid, you know, he's a little inventor. He took something to, to school to show his engineer teacher. He put together a little project where he made his own clock. He made a clock and took it to school to show his engineer teacher. And the, the school called the police on his ass and said that nigga had a bomb. And they went to the school and arrested the kid. There's pictures of him in handcuffs. He's 14 years old. They detained him, questioned him, put him in juvie. The whole nine. The whole shebang. So he's like confused. His parents are confused. No, they got that nigga wake up call. See, a lot of these people out here, see, that's the thing about white supremacy. Y'all think a lot of people come over here and think that they're going to jump on the side of white supremacy. No, white supremacy is circling its way. What's up, family? Welcome back to the Tariq Elite Radio Show. And this is your gracious host, Mr. Tariq Elite Nashi. Glad to have y'all tuning in. And don't forget to go to TariqElite.com, by the way, to get all that fresh gear, get the fresh New t-shirts, get the RB, RBG t-shirts, get those Melanoid Nation t-shirts, get the Melanoid Nation flag, and fly it high. Again, that's at TariqElite.com. Um, let me shout out to all the family. Thanks, everybody, for giving me all the well wishes. I didn't get a chance to do my, my live Ustream show this Sunday because my son, I had to take him to the emergency room. My son, TJ, he's two and a half, for those who don't know. And I had to take him to the emergency room because there was something going on. I think he had some kind of, I want to say stomach poisoning, a food poisoning or something. He ate or consumed something that messed his stomach up and he was throwing up like crazy. We thought it was some kind of stomach virus. And we went to the emergency room on Sunday night. I was there all night. They tried to give him something to stop the vomiting. They did like a ultrasound and they didn't find nothing. Then they felt around and didn't see nothing and did a urine test and didn't find anything so they sent us home but then the next day the next morning his heart was beating off fast he was still 
dragging around. So I took him back to the emergency room. And they really, we were there for a few hours. They didn't really do anything. You know, told us basically the same thing. He was throwing up in the hospital and, you know, we left. And yesterday I took him to another emergency room because I wasn't satisfied with the one I went to before. And they had to hook my son up to the uh, an IV because he was extremely dehydrated. And they did a uh, blood test on him and they, it didn't have a virus. That's the thing because a lot of people I was asking, hey, what's up? Who's calling? Hey, what's up, Tariq? This is Damien from Raleigh, North Carolina, man. Hey, Damien, how you doing, fam? I'm chilling, man. I'm on the way home. I don't know if you elaborated yet on the uh, Minister Farrakhan thing in South Carolina. Yeah, I'm gonna talk Just about, wondering what, what yeah, went on. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, man. Thank you for the call. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So let me let me just chop up some game because I do want to get into that situation with the minister. But before I get into that, there's a, let me talk about some other stories that's going on. There was a story online today about a 14-year-old Muslim boy one a dark skinned Muslim boy. He's not one of those pale Arab. He's a darker skinned Muslim boy. If it wasn't for his hair, you can just look at him and say, okay, that's just a brown skinned black guy, a brown skinned black kid. But he has the little, the Middle Eastern S curl. So that's a giveaway. But if he had a hat on, he'd just be another Melanoid brother walking around. 